All right, I'm sitting here with the lovely Maria, or Masha. Um, she was my translator in the Donbass when I went the last time. Now, why was she my translator in the Donbass? Why did I specifically choose her? The reason I chose her is because she's a staunch liberal. She's an anti-war protester. Um, and she had a set of beliefs about this conflict that I did not believe to be true. And uh, everything that I told her, she did not believe to be true. Um, she thought everything that I was saying was Russian propaganda, and I thought everything that she was saying was um, Western propaganda. And so I kind of gave her a challenge to come and see for herself. And it was a, a very interesting trip. Um, so we're gonna talk to uh, Maria and we're going to get her impressions. And we will see the conclusion of uh, what took place. So now I should note that in the beginning of the trip, on our way down, we had several disagreements about um, what was really happening. And I said, you know what? We're going to meet my friend Thomas Roper. Thomas, uh, for you guys that don't know, Thomas, he's a very prolific, uh, uh, prolific uh, geopolitical uh, writer. He's written seven books. He's a incredible. He's an incredible journalist, uh, and he's been to the Donbass uh, just as many times as I have. And so. Uh, he is much better at articulating than me. I thought that he would be able to uh, talk to Maria and maybe see her uh, to, to, to kind of put some uh, reason, not, not, not reason, but, uh, you know, maybe try to kind of help her with her thoughts. Because really, she was struggling a lot. Well, the normal impression of the, the Russian guys and, and girls and whatever um – were influenced by what I call Russian um, the Western propaganda because um, uh, there were many many emotions and, and, and not really many arguments. So she was just uh, emotionally telling what she's feeling, and when I tried to um, explain things, it was it didn't really come through. Um, this is a normal way which I see very often in Russia and also on, with Western people. That's normal because that's the Western how it's, the Western propaganda works. They they are just pushing on the emotions and when you are emotional you are not able um to, for for a real um fact fact-based argumentation so um at the end of the day somehow i just just told her okay well i see uh you will see it in donbass yourself this was well I, I, on some points maybe I, I i was able to make her think but i wasn't really able to convince her so um The conversation ended somehow with the words that I said, really, okay, you go and we talk afterwards. Um, but that's the problem, really, uh, that, that the Western propaganda is emotional. So, um, and you know this yourself. When you're afraid, when you are hating somebody, when you love somebody, you're not ready for emotions. If um, we know this from, from many stories, just in private life, um, when somebody is betraying you, but you love the person, you are not able to listen to arguments. And that's that's how emotions work, and that's how the Western propaganda works. They so, show emotional pictures, uh, tell emotional stories, and this switches off the analytic uh, thinking. And that's what's happening, and, and she was an example for that. Um, so I wasn't really able to convince her, absolutely not somehow. But uh, I ended the conversation with, you're a good girl, and we talk when you come back. Okay, John. Let's start from the beginning. All right. Just as a, as a, as a, as a background information, if you will, because it's not only true for myself. Mm -hmm. It's true for millions of people in Russia okay. who are horrified by this war. We all have ties with Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Either it's blood ties because it's family members, or it's friends, or it's both. It's inseparable. Mm -hmm. We are the same people. Probably if someone from Ukraine heard that now, they would be uh, denying that as as uh, vehemently as they could. But we are the same people, mm -hmm. actually. We grew up on the same movies, on the same music, on 
the same literature mm -hmm. we like the same food we are we have the same cultural references we truly are as close as nations as it can only possibly be okay the war with ukraine mm -hmm. is the most horrific thing that could possibly happen mm -hmm. i honestly do not have a vocabulary to describe that because it just shouldn't exist, so those words don't exist in my language or in English language or mm -hmm. in any language, I believe, because it's just beyond horrors to imagine that we could go with war to Ukraine. From, as we say in Russian, every iron, every day, we hear how this war, how this horrors, how this aggression is unmotivated, mm -hmm. how Russia went insane, how Ukraine is suffering, how it's absolutely undeserved, unprovoked, unreasonable, and how there is no forgiveness to anyone who is Russian, how we all, 150 millions of us, support it, um, what horrible people we are, all of that. Well, you know. Yeah, of course. I, I think every, everybody knows that. I don't have exact numbers. I don't think anyone has. But according to different evaluations, from like, and they vary from 200,000 to 2 million people fled Russia mm -hmm. since the beginning of the war. And I refuse to call it special operation. It is war. Okay. You know, they fled Russia just like Ukrainians flee Ukraine because they only they flee because they cannot stay here anymore. They suffocate here. They see Zs on cars, on billboards, mm -hmm. on even on socks, for God's sake, on everything. And it honestly makes you feel like you, you have no air. You cannot see this. Okay. You cannot see this. You, it's, it's unbearable physically. When it started, I fled <laughs> to the Far East mm -hmm. to work in a rehab center mm -hmm. because it would mean that I would stay within that rehab center and I wouldn't go out and I wouldn't be exposed to this Zets. Mm -hmm. And that was the only way to survive it, basically. Because I, I don't know, I, it's like you feel like you need to walk out of the window because <laughs> you, you cannot live through that. This is what is done to the people of Russia by the media, by the news, by this continuous narrative mm -hmm. that we are, I can say the bad guy, but it doesn't cover it. It's, I don't know, 1% of what we are <laughs> right. in the eyes of the world. That's what it is. Yeah. So this is this was the beginning for me. Um, sometime in April, I believe it was, you sent me the subtitles to translate mm -hmm. from several interviews that you took in Mariupol. That's right. And uh, and I was listening to what people were saying, trying to make sense of it trying to convey what they were saying the best way possible mm -hmm. and it was very much like I was listening to the Russian side of the propaganda it made me feel like wait a second that doesn't match and they could not be the propaganda people because they are just simple people on the streets they are not actors it's obvious that they are not actors mm. and uh, it was a very serious clash in my head. Uh, later on, sometime in the beginning of July, I believe it was, um, a friend of mine asked me to help him to get his brother, who was from Valnavaha, that's mm -hmm. a town between Mariupol and Donetsk, mm -hmm. uh, to get this person outside of Russia because the, he managed to leave Ukraine, mm -hmm. leave Donbass through, uh, through the Crimea mm -hmm. uh, to get him out to Germany. So we worked out the route 
for that person. Mm -hmm. And of course, we met in Moscow and they talked to that guy as well. Mm -hmm. And again, there was another first hand evidence and another clash. So I had to have my answers because what I was sure the truth was, mm -hmm. as I refused to believe anything that Russia was saying, any Russian, it was all like, oh no, it's all Russian propaganda, it's all lies. I tended to believe what the West is saying. Mm -hmm. Those were my sources. And what I received from these interviews that you sent to translate and mm -hmm. from this guy was saying was in absolute contrast to what I was receiving mm -hmm. from all other sources. So when you said that you're going and you need a translator, I said, well, you of course can have a choice, but pick me. I'm a yeah. good translator. That's that you are. Well, so I was in a, in a situation when I knew that I cannot go on anymore without having my questions answered. I had to know. Mm -hmm. And Thomas asked me, like, hey, it's, they are bombing there in Donetsk. Uh, they have these mines, these butterflies mm -hmm. laying around. It's dangerous. Aren't you afraid to go there? I'm like, Thomas, I don't care. I have to know because not Knowing is worse because not knowing is guaranteed doubts and frustrations and fears and shame. I mean, it's an incredible guilt that we all are feeling. It's a shame. It's like you are ashamed of who you are just because it is your passport, mm -hmm. just because you are born in this country and this is your citizenship and you're supposed to feel guilty and ashamed for that. Mm -hmm. It's unbearable. I had to go. Yeah. So I'm very thankful to you that you made it happen. <clears throat> well, and on our way, on our way almost to the border, uh, the hotel where we had rooms reserved, um, it got bombed. It did. And um, on one of your, um, I guess, pro-Ukrainian channel, would you call it that? Uh, let's say anti-Russian channels. Okay, on one of your anti-Russian channels, uh, somebody posted a video about how basically it was a fake and they were using actors to show... Yeah, how, the, how they were using actors to show that there are dead bodies there, that they're actually not dead bodies, but they are actors and bad actors as they are uh, playing the dead bodies and moving. Yeah. yeah. And so, um, uh, so one of the first things that we kind of encountered, I guess, was I had to run, we were running around uh, looking for a microphone cable and we went into a shop and there was a woman who was quite distraught. Yeah, we went to that market because uh, it's like electronic market mm -hmm. where if you need to find anything, that's the only place in Donetsk where you can have hopes to find it. Right. And we asked around for that cable. And as it always goes, people get interested uh, because we have a foreigner <laughs> so everybody everybody gets in, involved into a conversation and there was this girl who was really upset and she was going through a serious through serious personal issues as well and she saw me as some sort of a um, counselor i guess of some something like that mm -hmm. so she shared and we talked a lot and she said i just lost um person a, a friend uh, apparently she had a friend who walked by that hotel when when uh, that when it was bombed and that person died and a three-year-old daughter of that person died as well yeah maybe maybe on this video there was exactly the body of that person the video was filmed from the inside of the hotel so it's like a surveillance it's, camera maybe i mm -hmm. i don't know i'm not an expert i i, I wouldn't be able to tell um, and we, I asked about it and I was told by those who deal with it every day that it is normal for, for, as they say, fresh corpse to sometimes move. Sure. Absolutely. It happens. And apparently this is what, what, what caught, what was caught on the camera in this video. Yeah. But the cynicism of that, like, Hey, see, that's an actor when somebody lost life. Mm -hmm. 
it's it's insane. Yeah. So so let's talk about when we actually got into the Donbass, when we got to um, Donetsk and Lugansk. What was the first thing that actually struck you? Okay, we it took us a very long time to cross the border. Mm -hmm. So we uh, and uh, the hotel was bombed and uh, we didn't have a place to stay and mm -hmm. it was already relatively late in the evening. So uh, John called his friend, another journalist, Graham Phillips, who lives in Lugansk currently. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was uh, a wonderful host. He said, come over to Lugansk and stay, instead of Donetsk, go to Lugansk and mm. stay there. So our first couple of days were actually in Lugansk. He hosted us, which was really super kind of him. Graham, if you watch this, thank you so much. You're wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> so anyway, what I'm trying to say is that we arrived to Lugansk and uh, it everything is covered with those Zs. Mm -hmm. Every vehicle, every bus stop, every, uh, basically every surface. Everyone wears chevrons with Zs, all of it. Mm -hmm. Please understand, this is the, in my head, this is the new swastika. This is the sign that Russia is turning into a fascist Germany. And then we go to Donbass that we are, according to the news, destroying, mm -hmm. yes? And everything there is covered with Zs. How right. can that possibly be? If people hate us so much, if we are such an enemy, if we are such a will, such a villain, that if we are such a monster, that everything there is covered with the symbol, and the symbol gets complete support. That would be like the Jews wearing voluntarily walking around with a Nazi symbol on their sort of with a swastika. Sort of. It makes no sense. It's it it did make no sense. I was like, what is that? Next day, uh, we had a, uh, we went to Severodonetsk, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it is the city which is in a similar condition as Mariupol in terms of devastation. Mm -hmm. It's it's horrible. Yet, uh, I mean, they have no water, no electricity, no no nothing. Yet there are people who stayed there, who live there in basements. Mm -hmm. We went to one yard and uh, there is a children's playground mm -hmm. and graves right on this play playground right there mm -hmm. it was the the first biggest shock that i had when i when i looked at it live when it's not a photo or i don't know some video that you watch on tv but when you see it live this playground and those graves right there and there are people there and they talk to them a little bit and not a single one of them expressed any kind of negativity towards Russia. All the negativity was aimed at Ukraine. Mm -hmm. That was another clash in information, which was crucial to me. Like, how come you're not tearing me apart? I am Russian. <laughs> it is my people who did that to you and in my head. Mm -hmm. And the answer was, no, 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 no. It's not this way. And then these conversations repeated in Mariupol, in Lugansk, in Donetsk, in Volnavaha. They repeated all in all the places where we went to. So it was, it was kind of extreme red peeling, if you will, for me to accept that. Um, on the second day, because I would say it's second day, we had a meeting with uh, Vlad Denega, mm -hmm. the guy who is currently a Minister of Foreign Affairs of Lugansk People's Republic. Mm -hmm. He was responsible for the negotiations in Minsk that lasted during all this almost eight years. He was there on every meeting. Mm -hmm. And John was kind enough to say like, hey, what would be your questions to that guy? So the questions that were asked to this guy were my questions. They might seem naive because they are of a person who has no clue. I had no clue. 
And it's it's true. I, I really didn't know. I wasn't following that much. My the, um, attitude to that was like during all these eight years that preceded it from 2014, my attitude was like, this is internal Ukrainian business. Russia has nothing to do with it. Ukraine should resolve it themselves. Let them resolve it themselves. And I didn't look deep into that. It was like their business. I don't, I let them be. Mm-hmm. I am very much not proud of that now. I should have paid attention. I should have paid more attention. So this person, Vlad Deniego, he was explaining from the start, because my first question was, how come that the people of Donbass are hated so much mm-hmm. that they are being physically destroyed, basically, during mm-hmm. all these eight years? Why are they hated so much? And it's a two-hour interview of explanation of what was happening, yeah. how it came up to be, how it reached this point. He really went in depth. He was amazing. Um, and I will just kind of note on a side note, for me, you know, I I know what answers I want to hear. Um, but the most important for me is to show the other side, um, show, show the other side what's actually happening. And if I use my mindset that's not going to help anything. So I wanted to make sure that she asked her questions because she has the mindset that a lot of other uh, liberal anti-war protesters have. And so for me, this is very important to kind of reach across the aisle and try to answer these questions, to try to um, take away some of these um, uh, myths, I guess, that are being said. So... Okay, so go ahead. So anyway, I received this explanation and the story and the 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 whole the whole story of how it developed and how what started on in February was basically unavoidable. Mm-hmm. It would have started anyway sooner or later. Mm-hmm. That truly was no other way in that situation. Yeah. Which is crazy, but I had to accept it because it it really was something unavoidable. Yeah. My question for the reasons for hate to everything that is to, to the people of Donbass and now to everything that is Russian remained though. And I got that question answered from another interview that we had um a few days later. Uh with uh, the guy who is uh, a counselor, an advisor to the head of the Donetsk People's Republic. Mm -hmm. His name is Jan Gagin, and he is a high rank military official, a very knowledgeable person, Mm -hmm. a very smart guy. You know, he, uh, he helped us a lot. We went together to Mariupol to deliver humanitarian help, and in one of those, during this trip, uh, he went to a school and uh, found a bunch of books there in the school library and brought those books and showed those books to us. And this interview was about these findings. Mm-hmm. And uh, these books are aimed at children from school children for, from like probably seven years old till the time they finish school. So they are different levels, mm-hmm. starting from just books with pictures because little children they think in images they don't really read much but they remember pictures to history books to all kind of analytical books so it's it's that literature that is needed for the education and it it is clear that from the early age it gets put into the brains of children how we are enemies with Ukraine mm-hmm that we are not brother nations like Russians think, that we have zero uh, common cultural background that doesn't exist, that uh, we are enemies, that we should be hated, that we are basically being dehumanized in their eyes from the early age on. Imagine seeing that for someone who 
went to school and uh, went to, and learned there that well there was Kiev Rush, Kievskaya Rush, the Kiev Russia, that Kiev is the mother of all Russian cities. There is a stone in Kiev with engraving on it from here the Russian land began. Mm-hmm. You know, and then you you see the other side, what is taught to the kids in the Ukraine. And I still ask why, why, why all these lies, why all this hatred being indoctrinated. And this is the reason why the there are people in Ukraine. I, I know not all of them. I'm absolutely sure, just like there are different Russians, there are different Ukrainians, not all of them, but truly there are people of Ukraine who support and have supported these bombings of Donbass, this elimination of the population there mm-hmm. during all these years. Mm-hmm. That was the answer why that happened. Yeah. Um, all right, so we went to uh, Valhalla, to the hospital. Valhalla. Yeah, sorry. Uh, so we went there. We went to the hospital. Um, we met the doctors. And uh, how did you feel about that trip? In Valnavaja, they held 600 people in basements. They held them hostages. They didn't let them go. Who? The Ukrainian troops. I'm sorry. I'm I'm turning into these people. I just say they. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The Ukrainian troops were holding them hostages in the basements of the hospital. Mm-hmm. There were patients, there were wounded people, there were civilians they could catch and put there, there were um, medical personnel, everyone. Mm-hmm. They spent months in the basement. Mm-hmm. We walked around um, some areas of this basement. So where they slept, where they ate, how they lived there. And they are like, it's impossible conditions. At the same time, the Ukrainian troops found the storage of drugs in the hospital, broke into that safe and got themselves high on those wonderful cocktail of uh, adrenaline and, and opium, which makes you fearless which makes you really high which makes you do crazy things and not care mm-hmm. I'm sure it's fun so they were they were running around shooting at everywhere through the well it's just insane it's like human hunting or something I imagine it's just crazy they did you know it's that kind of thing and uh, at a certain point when they were retreating because uh, they were running away from the from the Russians and the Donetsk, so the Allied forces. Mm-hmm. They decided to destroy the evidence of that whole thing and they wanted and they shot from the tank. There was direct shot from from, from the tank that was there. Uh, and we saw the hole in the wall that this shot left to make sure that the building collapses over the people who were in the basement. Civilians children. They had six children born during this month in this basement. Mm -hmm. Like, newly born children. All of them. Just to be dead. Just to die under the room, under the what remains of the building after Mm -hmm. you shoot at it from a tank. What's the reason to destroy a hospital? It's a hospital. They know exactly that it's a hospital. They received medical help from those doctors, even though they were Ukrainians. Yeah. Uh, One of the very interesting things that I heard while we were there is that one of the injured people was a native English speaker. So either American or Canadian or British. And he was injured, not mortally, but to the point where he couldn't evacuate with the rest of the Ukrainians. So uh, they shot him in the back of the head. Yeah, not not to deal with uh, dragging of the wounded or something. Just they said that there were several bodies and their faces were disfigured. Their f- 
fingerprints were removed so that they wouldn't be recognized. Yeah. So they were removing the evidence this way. Just shot them dead. It's wild. Yeah. It's wild. Um, yeah. So, so that was the hospital. Uh, what, what, what else, uh, what else did you... Uh, on the on the last day, we went to the front line to the city to the town called Svitogorsk, mm -hmm. and uh, this is where they have active fighting. This is where, from about forty five hundred people, about fifteen hundred people still remain. Mm -hmm. They hide in in basements and somewhere and in churches. Uh, there, there is a big church there where people hide as well, and uh, they are terrified there. Apparently, two days before, uh, mm -hmm. there was a, a group of journalists mm -hmm. who filmed them and put it online, and it all went to the Ukrainian TV as well. So people were recognized, and these people have relatives in Ukrainian towns. Kharkov was named for sure among these towns. And mm -hmm. now these relatives of these people are hunted and they say that they're like number ones to be killed. Mm -hmm. So these people are terrified not only because they are the targets for snipers, mm -hmm. not only because they fear for their own lives, but because they also fear, and maybe even more, for the lives of their relatives, for their families who are in Ukraine. Yeah. Which, to me, is just, it's just beyond comprehension. Yeah. Um, so, uh, me and um, Nikita from, uh, well, you guys have seen Nikita in my past videos, from Buhanka Project. And Masha, um, and uh, a priest, uh, Father Andre, and a nurse, Tatiana, uh, we all went uh, to this town. And when we got there, they said, you can't leave your vehicles out in the open because it could get bombed by drones or you can be shot by snipers. So we had to rush in with our vehicles filled with food put them into a garage to unload everything and then rush them back out. And, uh, you know, I have to say to Maria's, to Maria's credit here, she is rock solid. We were walking down these streets where snipers were 200 meters away, um, on the other side of the river. Now, granted it, it we wouldn't have been an easy shot because there were destroyed buildings in the way, but, Still, the the risk was very high, and uh, you know she's walking along in her vest, kind of taking in everything. Uh, she was absolutely amazing. You know, when I began the trip, I told her I will only take you if you uh, are objective and you keep an open mind, and that she did a hundred percent. And what was your feeling on seeing that town? I mean. You, the bombing was going on uh, not far from us. You could see all the smoke rising. Um, what was your feeling? It has to stop. It somehow has to stop. I don't know what should happen for this to be over, but it should not exist like this. That's true. If I could take all these people and get them out of there, mm -hmm. I would. If I could have some sort of a magic coverage to just cover them away so they're not visible and they are not, uh, and it is not possible to harm them through that coverage, I'd use it. Mm -hmm. You really feel very helpless. Even though you bring help, humanitarian help, you bring all this food, you, 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 you try to do something, but you still feel so helpless against this crime yeah so how do you feel you feel like you do what you can and you also constantly understand that it is so little and you know that you have to go back 
because being elsewhere makes no sense at all. You have to go back. Yeah. And do the do what you can. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, not to insert a shameless plug here, but if you guys want to donate to the people, uh, we are going to be making more humanitarian trips. You can send to my PayPal. I will get the bunny here where you can send Bitcoin. The link is in the description below. Um, but, you know, we, uh, on limited funds, we did a lot of stuff. We, we, we got a lot done. I mean, yeah. We, we, did. And we spent all we had. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> totally. Uh, all uh, we had. Unfortunately. I, yeah. So on, on the last, on the, on the way back, we had to, we had to sleep in the car. We didn't have money for the hotel. We just yeah. spent it all. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that wasn't good. But, um, you know, even as far east as Svetogorsk. Um, as far west. I, I mean, yeah. I keep saying that. E even as far west as Svetogorsk was, you know, it was interesting because the people said, uh, we do not want to talk to you on camera, do not film our faces. But when we are liberated, that was very specific, when we are liberated by Russia and we are safe, then we will speak to you all that, that you want. They are, they want. They want the world to know only when it's safe for them. Yeah. Right now, they don't believe it's safe for them, and they are scared, scared to death for their families. Yeah, but they want their independence. Have, did you notice this? They want, they, they don't want to be a part of a country that hates they, them so much. They don't want to be a part of Ukraine for sure. So, um, on our way back, uh, another thing that she has read on a bunch of her anti-Russian channels. Um, the fact that refugees are treated so incredibly bad by the Russians. So I decided to stop at a refugee center. And uh, we, we called, we got the director. Uh, we only gave them, what, 20 minutes notice? Even less. We gave them 20 minutes notice. So it's not like they could like clean and make everything orderly. We gave them 20 minutes notice. So, uh, what was your opinion of uh, going to see that um, uh, that refugee center? Well, Did it's like a pretty decent hotel, basically. Yeah. It's really nice. It's clean. It's very well thought through. Mm -hmm. They have great canteen with really great food. Uh, I mean, they eat better than I do. Uh, yeah, I know, <laughs> they're right? Really, they really have great food. Canteen is a cafeteria. For yeah, it's food. it's called canteen. You know, yeah. Or you can say it's a restaurant. Basically, yeah. it, it it's simple, but in terms of food quality, it's a restaurant. Yeah, yeah. Cause we... That's for sure. And they live there for as long as they need. Mm -hmm. There is no pressure or any time frame within which they need to move out. So mm -hmm. they can stay for as long as they need. It's free. Food is free. They have a way to find work. Some people that I talked to have already found jobs so they can make a living. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the women I talked to came with her son mm -hmm. and she already arranged it, uh, arranged everything. So on the 1st of September, her son will go to school in Varonish. Mm -hmm. It's all possible. It's all provided. Mm -hmm. And uh, they leave, they went there voluntarily. Mm -hmm. They explained to me how it works because in the Western media it is said that we, we uh, evil Russians, uh, grab them, put them in buses and just bring them to Russia for... Um, labor camps. Labor camps. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I've like seen that. We eat them alive, we take their organs, we take away their passports, all that stuff. Yeah. I mean... You don't stop at anything when it comes to that, to those lies. Mm -hmm. The wor the worse there is, the better. Uh, so it's like you you put whatever there. It will be accepted, of course, because that's us, the evil Russians. That's mm -hmm. what we do, right? <laughs> so it's a it's a, it's a, it's a really nice place. They are in really good conditions. They can do whatever they want. They can leave at any moment if they want, or they can stay for as long as they want, if they want. Mm -hmm. And it's free of charge. When they, their only job was to get to the border. At the border, they had, uh, there were buses from different towns because they were, 
the woman I talked to said that they had eight towns to choose mm -hmm. where they want to go in Russia, and she chose Voronezh. Mm -hmm. But there were eight towns to choose, and they were brought there. Mm -hmm. That's how it went. There was one woman from Kharkov who constantly asked, uh, when are you going to take my passport away from me? Like, why would we take away your passport away from you? <laughs> why? Why? Like, because I heard that you take away passports and you then force people to work and, and don't give them passports back so that they would be motivated to work for free or something like that. I mean, crazy. But this is what you hear in the this Western media. This is what's in the media, yes. So, you as somebody who saw everything reported in the media, believed everything that was reported in the Western media, and was quite anti-Russian at the very beginning very of this. Yes. Very anti-Russian at the beginning of this. How much of what you now know that you read, uh, how much of what you read that you now know is not true? All of it. All of it. The proportion of those lies, mm -hmm. the scale of that is is very much comparable with the scale of the horror of this war. Mm -hmm. It is that much. The cynicism of that is incomprehensible. It's just insane. There is zero word of truth in that. I thought, okay, maybe, okay, maybe there are exaggerations. And, you know, the truth is the first victim at the war. I mean, it's a famous phrase, but maybe at least half of it is true. Yeah. No? Nothing of it is true. Nothing. No, so sad. it was a sweet red pill to know that my country is actually not a villain and I don't have to say that country yeah. about my country because it is my country and what it's doing is explainable. Yeah. So, well, thank you so much. I am absolutely sure that this interview is going to open a lot of eyes uh, just because of your background. And uh, we'll see where we were at the beginning of this adventure and where we are now at the end of, of this adventure. It's quite a transformation actually yes. to see. Uh, and I watched, I watched her transform during this whole trip and it, it was really amazing. It was quite, it was amazing. It is an absolute eye opening and I know that I will go back. Yeah. Well, Somehow I will go back. Yes. We will go back because I need a great translator. By the way, she is, Hands down, the best translator I have ever met in my entire life. Um, her words are absolutely fluid. I've never seen anything like it in my life. So, absolutely brilliant. If anybody needs a translator, well, you guys need to reach out for her. So, anyways, John Mark Dugan. And uh, we hope that uh, you found this interview enlightening. And make sure you like and subscribe. Thank you very much.